as trite as it might sound, I do think that awareness and personal reflection has to be the starting point because what you will realize as you look at your life, and this is something I realize about my life every day, um, is just how much screens are slipping in in ways that you never could have even imagined. Welcome to Homeschool Talks, a podcast by HSLDA. This is a show about all things homeschooling, from practical tips to inspiring stories and everything in between. We're so glad you've joined us today, and we hope you enjoy the program. Welcome to Homeschool Talks. I'm Jim Mason, Vice President at Homeschool Legal Defense Association. And today, my guests are Andy and Amy Crouch. Um, They have co-authored a book called My Tech Wise Life, Growing Up and Making Choices in a World of Devices. I've been through it. It's great. Um, Amy is currently a student at Cornell University up in Ithaca, New York, where she is today. And Andy is the partner for theology and culture um, and serves as a teacher and mentor and framework builder for Praxis. Um, He's a, a, a writer and has written frequently for Christianity Today and other outlets and has authored numerous books. Welcome, Andy and Amy. And if there's anything you'd like to add about yourselves that I messed up, please do so now. Thank you. (laughs) That's very good. It's great to be here. So Amy is up there in Ithaca, New York at Cornell University. And the topic of your book is tech wise life and how to kind of manage tech. And so I, I, it would be remiss of me not to start with this. I am kind of a techie person in a really kind of old fashioned way. (laughs) And I, you can't probably see this very well, uh, have on my smartphone, a Merlin um, bird identifying app. No way. Which which is from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology of which I have been a long time member. I get their publications. I love it. Fantastic. So so you do linguistics. Do you have any association with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology? (laughs) <laughs> um, not really, although one of my really close friends worked there for a while, but I don't know. I think everyone at Cornell, like we kind of share in the glory of the Cornell lab. So I'm so glad that you have Merlin. I use it all the time when I see a bird that I want to figure out. Yeah. So th- it's kind of an interesting entree into the topic today because, you know, years ago I had to travel the world with either field books right. and, you know, exactly. f- scare the birds away while I fumbled through them or... Um, Now, today, I can just pull out this, you know, massive World Wide Web computer and do it immediately in my phone. (laughs) Yes. So uh, the the, the technology, um, as you point out in your book, it's, you know, it's a blessing and a curse. (laughs) So let's let's start with that. How did you guys... Um, I know, Andy, you wrote a book previously uh, about uh, TechWise Family. So how did you guys start out to write a book together? Maybe I'll start with my side of the story in a way. Um, Yeah, so this story does begin with my earlier book, The TechWise Family, which was um, came out of our (laughs) bumbling, stumbling efforts to raise uh, two children, Amy and her older brother, Timothy, in a world that is so different from the world that we had grown up in, my, my wife, Catherine, and I, uh, so different from what our own parents had grown up in, uh, and try to figure that out from the perspective of people who, uh, in many ways, love technology and some of the things that it can do. Uh, I'm also a techie, Jim, in <laughs> every way. I, um, My dad, actually, when I was my first sort of uh, homeschooling experience, you might say, though I was in public school most of the time, my dad took me out of fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh grade one day a week to uh, tag along with him to Syracuse University, where he taught. And he just dropped me off at the computer center. And I I, I was sort of uh, self-taught on the very earliest generation of, you know, what we called back then mainframe computers. So I've been interested in, in and love uh, computer technology my whole life. Um, we certainly had it in our home, but as our children were growing up, um, we started to realize that if we did not make very intentional choices, we would end up with a life as a family that was much less than what we hoped for and that there were also some real curses that come along with the blessing. So uh, as our kids got to the end of their adolescent years, I started to feel like maybe we had learned something that we could share and TechWise Family was about that. Um, 
And I thought it would be good to have one of the kids write a little preface to the book to just certify <laughs> that you can raise children in this highly technological age in a very, in, in a, you know, in some ways, very low tech way and what we would call a tech wise way. And they will actually be grateful. And so I wanted a uh, firsthand, you know, testimony. And so Amy wrote the foreword to that book. And I got so many comments about the foreword uh, that I got as many comments about the you know first four or five pages of the book that Amy wrote than the rest of the book that I wrote. Um, and then as I started to talk with parents and families and educators and you know all different kinds of groups about these topics, uh, over and over they said, I wish we had something that was written kind of by teens for teens. And that's when we hatched this idea that maybe there would be a good follow-up that would be primarily Amy's voice uh, with a little bit of me uh, from the the kid's point of view. Yeah. Yeah, I love the... Uh, uh, let's get, go ahead, Amy. I was going to just turn it over to you. And um, if I could just make one comment before I turn it over to you. I love the way the book is laid out with uh, mostly Amy and le kind of letters from you back and yeah. uh, uh, reflecting on what she's written. And if I... As a father of seven children, two daughters, my daughter's kind of bracket in age, Amy, uh -huh. one's a little older and one's a little younger. Um, the first letter kind of broke my heart, actually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was just it was just such a good letter from a father to a daughter. Um, <laughs> I really I really appreciated that. So, Amy, now tell us the real story. <laughs> oh, well, I, I would not contradict anything of what dad said, but. I think in particular what we were looking for when we chose to write this book to people my age um, was uh, just just treating people my age with um, a, a very real amount of honesty and, and hopefulness about how we could live with technology. Because I very often, you know, the stereotype about my generation is that we're just sort of screen addicted zombies. And, you know, it's not like there is no truth to that, but, um, I think the very the reality is that while our lives are absolutely saturated by screens, most people my age feels like there's something wrong with that and we're not quite sure what it is. And so I think part of what we were hoping to do with this book was reach out to the many young people who wish that life didn't have to look like it does right now, but really aren't sure of how we can actually make any changes. And so the book is fundamentally about saying life doesn't have to be like this. Mm. We don't need to just kind of accept the, the tech saturated world that's been handed over to us. And we actually have a great deal of agency, both individually and as members of our communities um, to, to take steps towards a healthier way of living with screens. So what would you say is the very first step to hmm. moving from, I don't know, what, what do you call the opposite of a tech-wise life to the tech-wise <laughs> life? <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm going to tell you guys, you convicted me so many times as I'm reading through this book because, you know, like you, you say in one part, one part, well, I was, you know, sitting with my friends having coffee and all of a sudden I looked up and they were having this wonderful conversation. I had no idea what they were talking about. And I'm like, uh oh, <laughs> my wife has pointed that out to me a few times. <laughs> so <laughs> where, <laughs> what, where do you begin? Where do you start? Mm. Well, oh, goodness. It, I know that you said one thing. And so I really can't cheat too much. Um, but I do, I think the, the most important way to start is self-reflection, but that self-reflection then needs to lead into practices. Um, and one of the things that I, that we talk about over and over in the book is simply looking at your life and asking, what is technology doing to me? Because one of the things about our devices and our, our screens are so good at flying under the radar. Our devices very easily just slip into our lives in a way that we don't even question. And so as trite as it might sound, I do think that awareness and personal reflection has to be the starting point because what you will realize as you look at your life, and this is something I realize about my life every day, um, is just how much screens are slipping in in ways that you never could have even imagined. Um, and the thing is that that kind of self-reflection can easily lead to frustration or despair and a sense of, oh my goodness, I look at my phone for an hour every morning and I waste time constantly. I, you know, it, it can so easily fall into a feeling that there's just nothing to do. And so 
I think that self-reflection has to be paired with a set of practices and with saying, actually, there are simple steps I can take to use tech in, in a way that is wise and good. Um, and not to fall into the pit of, oh, no, I'm screen addicted and there's nothing to do about it. <laughs> so after you've reflected and um, learned that you are screen addicted or not tech wise, each of your chapters has some kind of helpful suggestions. Um, what's the what's the most helpful suggestion for change? Uh, and I'm not going to limit you to one. You can have two or three. Uh, or <laughs> Well, I might, I might jump in. I imagine Amy would say this early in her list too. Um, I think a rhythm of on and off that is intentional and regular is tremendously valuable. It actually helps even in the kind of self-reflection that Amy was talking about, because it's actually when we intentionally turn these things off um, that we discover ways in which we've unknowingly or unintentionally become uh, dependent on them. And we have a chance to reset and make different choices. So um, in the TechWise family, I talked about a family rhythm, which I will say to some, probably some of your listeners, viewers of this, uh, they'll just think this is way too minimal. And then others will think this sounds absolutely impossible to imagine. So it's it's interesting how different the reactions are get to this. But we had sort of a minimal practice in our family of one hour a day, one day a week, and one week a year of total engagement, really from almost anything with an on or off switch, turn it off. So for us, the one hour of day uh, when the kids were small was kind of the last hour of the day, bath time, bedtime, having a whole hour where the, and by the way, I, I always think, think it's very important to say, this is for the parents just as much as the kids. This is not a rule for the kids. This is a family practice. Um, and so we would have that bedtime. Then as the kids got older, it shifted to dinner time. At dinner time, many, many nights in the uh, darker uh, months of the year, we would turn off the electric lights and light candles. And I actually think it's not just the glowing rectangles in our lives. It's all the devices in our lives that um, do in certain important ways make our lives easier. We get that. But also kind of take over uh, in, in realms of experience that if we just would shut off that switch or find the power source and unplug for an hour, um, we would discover new ways of being human. You have a different kind of conversation by candlelight than you do by electric light, even by nice, you know, dim electric light. <laughs> so one hour a day, that was dinner time. One day a week for our family, that was Sunday generally. Um, and we, I know Amy is a very enthusiastic, uh, enthousi enthusiastic proponent of the Sabbath principle that we get from Jewish and Christian tradition. Uh, and then one week a year. Uh, and for us, we had the privilege as a family of being able to go away for a couple of weeks usually in the summer and at least one of, the, one of those weeks just completely disengaging from screens. And it, it you know, it may not be enough. I've, I've met many families who say, my gosh, if I let my kids have uh, 15 out of the 16 hours that they're awake on the screen, <laughs> that would not be good. One hour is not enough. So, you know, think about what's right for your own family, but the principle of a rhythm of on and off has tremendous power to decenter these uh, devices, which really are are designed by their designers to be always on, always present, always helpful. And when you uh, turn them off, you start this wonderful detox process. And somehow, when you turn them back on, they aren't the same. Uh, yeah. They don't have the same yeah. kind of uh, compulsive power that they had before. At least that's been our experience. So, as a as a young woman away at college, have you continued? Uh, following that rhythm? Yes, I have. And I I genuinely would say that I see my family's practices as I, as I grew up. I see those as a gift that they gave to me and that I still have and still use. Um, and in particular, I, I would highlight two things which both have to do with rest, which, well, rest is important to everyone. And I, I do feel like as a college student, there are particularly compelling distortions of rest and particularly unhealthy patterns around rest, shall we say. Um, and so what I would add to what, what dad said is a practice I continue quite strictly for myself is um, leaving my phone out of the bedroom when I go to sleep. 
And so <laughs> every night before I go to sleep, I, I live in an apartment. So I have, you know, a living room and, and then my bedroom. Um, I plug my phone in the living room. I let it go to sleep. And then I myself start getting ready for bre bed, brush my teeth um, and, and head to sleep without my glowing rectangle. And then I wake up and have a few precious minutes in the morning before I start looking at my phone. It's not right on the bedside table where I could just grab it in my sleepy haze, but no, I have several moments. In fact, I often try to make it longer and take at least half an hour of quiet reflection without, without my phone. And I, I think it's, it's so hard. It's hard to overstate, honestly, how big of a difference this makes in my day um, yeah. to start out the day without being bombarded by all of the emails telling me of everything that I'm behind of and all of the assignments. And, you know, I just got this grade on this exam um, is really amazing. And then to go to sleep without kind of being able to close my eyes, my eyes without having just scrolled through hours and hours um, of mindless distraction is really powerful. Mm -hmm. My uh, younger daughter and I, uh, I guess it's probably, it's before the pandemic. So, I mean, I guess, you know, from now on, it used to be, where were you when Kennedy was shot? <laughs> where were you on 9-11 and now pre-pandemic and post-pandemic? Um, I've been around that long, so I can I can answer where I was when Kennedy was shot. Um, but a cup of uh, sometime before the pandemic, my daughter, who was then a teenager, and I made a pinky promise one day uh, in the parking lot outside church because we realized we were taking our phones into church. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah. this whole thing you're talking about, I mean, yes. here we are going into church for the purpose of you know, worship and devotion and fellowship and all those things. And we were taking our devices in, yeah. not intending to do anything, you know, right. but they're just <laughs> always there. So we made a pinky promise that we would leave our phones in the car yep. yeah. on Sunday when we went into church. And I, I mean, it it actually, it, 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 it the addiction cycle sort of reaction, it's like, you want, I, I'm reaching for my pocket for my phone, yes. you know, until you kind of get used to it. Yeah. So we, yes. we started sort of um, finding some, you know, creating oases like that for yeah. important uh, moments. Absolutely. Hmm. And you know, what I love uh, about that example uh, is you didn't make a pinky promise that in church, you wouldn't look at your phone. You no. made the pinky <laughs> promise that you would leave the phone in the car. And it's because it is so, oh my goodness. I, it is absolutely st still true of me that if I were to go up to my room um, with yes, my phone, with with, the phone, I would look at it. And <laughs> I am you know, not some kind of, you know, I don't have like self-control superpowers. I absolutely would. And it's the act of actually saying, no, I'm going to put my phone in the car. And I know that in church, there will probably be a moment where I think to myself, oh, I want to, you know, I want to check something on my phone. And then realizing that you can't is so, so powerful. And I think what both you and I do is we recognize the limits of our self-control and that mm -hmm. we shouldn't need to put ourselves in a position where I have to actually, you know, actively decide not to use my phone. Instead, I remove that option from, from what I can do. Can I add one, one thought to that, which is, I also think something very important happens on the other side of that experience mm -hmm. of disorientation mm -hmm. and distress uh, or detox, you might say, where you're realizing it's not with me. Okay. I don't have the option to uh, sort of soothe that feeling of distractedness or, or whatever by by taking it out, even just for a moment, just to know it's there. You know, it's it's gone. <laughs> it's not here. That's a distressing moment in some odd kind of psych psychological, even neurological way, I think. Um and something amazing always happens on the other side of that. Mm -hmm. We we had this yeah. saying when the kids were smaller, and it's still true, and it's still true for me as a grown up. Um, creativity is on the other side of boredom. Mm -hmm. So boredom is that feeling of disorientation, distress, detox from stimulation, where you feel you'll do almost anything to get get back in a sort of stimulated, uh, taken care of state. But if you keep pressing through that moment you will find a creative moment mm -hmm. on the other side yeah. that you never would have found if you relieved the boredom with distraction. So that I really think um, there's something very deep and I think it applies to anything that threatens to be compulsive in our lives is 
if you push through that, um, that sense of distress, you actually find a new way of doing life on the other side that, that's better. And that changes how you go back to the, whatever the thing yeah. is that you were missing. So that's why your purposeful create rhythms of, um, of device use is, is yes. important. I mean, I think it, so go ahead and expand on that. That's no, that's right. It kind of goes back to what Amy was saying, that that it's not just a matter of having the will or intention yeah. to use my screen less. Or it's I really have to build in a long enough duration where I don't have the option. I'm not making choices one way or another. I've just I've ruled it out for a while. And I'm going to hit those speed bumps of distress and not be able to just assuage them with, you know, whatever the thing is that that I'm I'm bound to and there's a kind of liberation that happens on yeah. the other other side of that, that that only the practice only the kind of rhythmic regular just decision for this hour we our family just doesn't do these things and so we got to find something else to do and the other things you find to do are amazing so i wanted to go through a couple of the chapters in your book sure. um one of the things that is very distressing to me these days and is just in general is um, kind of the effects of things like TikTok and Instagram um, on on young people, especially young women. Yeah. And you know, you you have a a chapter in here about we don't have to compare ourselves. Can you talk to me about the the risks of the of, of those um, you know outlets like and 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 the comparing um, that that yeah. creates and. Absolutely. Well, it, it's I'm I'm glad you bring this up. And one of the interesting things is I've actually, in some ways, I've ended up feeling a little stronger on this than my dad, or at least in the sense that I actually am now completely free of social media. Well, except for LinkedIn. Um, but and and I think that <laughs> the most boring. For, if anyone can get addicted to LinkedIn, that, that's yeah, right. it's it's um, it's not possible. <laughs> but it is interesting. My dad actually uses social media more than I do. And I don't think that's because I, I, I completely trust my dad's decisions and I think they are wise. But I think that part of it is that I am a 21 year old woman and mm. being on social media at my age and at my stage, I, I think, I don't know. I think it is uniquely challenging and damaging in mm. a way that thankfully it is not necessarily for, for, for everyone. Mm. And I, goodness gracious, I, I could speak so much about the challenges that we see in social media, but I will, I'll try to keep it brief by simply saying that social media offers us all what we so deeply long for, which is the opportunity to make ourselves in our own image. And I actually, my friend sent me an Instagram ad, which said just that, make yourself in your own image. Um, oh my gosh. And oh we my all gosh. want to do this and our, uh, it's what we really are longing to do is to have total control over who I am, how others perceive me, to be able to absolutely wow. curate every moment of my life um, such that those who observe me will draw the judgments that I want. Uh, and uh, uh. this is so compelling but it is also the root of, of discontentment. Because what we will realize is that I can never make myself perfect enough. Mm. No matter how much I filter my photos or edit them, no matter how, you know, how many followers I may have on a given platform, I will never be able to live up to um, the standards of perfection or even of over-perfection that, that mm. I can imagine. And mm. that feeling is devastating. I, and that's a more sort of theoretical um, discussion, but m even moving to the sort of practical side of things, um, I think it is absolutely true that people my age, the expectation is that every single moment you have to consider mm. its potential for entertaining other people and not just entertaining, mm. but impressing other people impressing. for being yeah, photogenic. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I think of, I mean, this, it's always been true, right? That you, you take pictures before school dances, right? But mm. It has not necessarily always been true. At least I, I, this is what I've learned from older people. It's not always necessarily been true that you choose to take, that you have to take those photos and share them publicly and submit them to mm. a feedback system for everyone in your social mm. circle. Um, mm. 
And so I just absolutely notice in, in myself and in so many other young women, particularly my age, um, is this feeling of noticing every moment and questioning whether it's sufficiently photogenic and thinking about how how this moment might um, mm -hmm. might read to somebody else who would they like it would they not like it and it just hurts so much I don't want to downplay the you know the opportunities that that social media gives especially when I think of of artists who are able to use their platforms to share their craft um, and even the ways that uh, social media has the potential to connect people through deep suffering. So I don't want to downplay that altogether. But I do think that the dominant mode, the kind of the way that social media expects mm. us to behave is curating ourselves as if we are a brand. And mm -hmm. that is not, not the way to live. Mm -hmm. Wow. So um, my children, this is, you know, Andy, you'll, you'll understand this. My children are in many ways much wiser than I am. <laughs> <laughs> they they uh they they discovered social media and abandoned it ah, about yes. the same time as I was discovering it. Right? <laughs> 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 and, and so, they were looking for the exit ramp as you were oh, hitting man. the accelerator. <laughs> and I was thinking, like, what have I done wrong? My kids aren't normal. I mean, it's, this is cool. <laughs> like, what is, <you> know, so, <laughs> and, and then, and then, you know, this is this is terrible. I'm old enough to know better, but I would post a thing, you know, and I think, yeah. oh, this is really clever. Yes. And and you know, one time it would get like, oh, hundred likes in like an hour. Wow, cool. And I was thinking, wow, you know, what a great guy I am. And then I put another really clever thing up and it would only get like 12 likes. No! Like, oh, what? Whoa, people hate me. What happened? <laughs> and, you know, it's very subtle, but, but oh my gosh. you know, it's a great way of kind of keeping in touch. It's a great way. You know, there's I, I have a little thing where I say there's a song for everything. Right. It's just kind of like a dad joke. I mean, you made a dad joke and I, you know, I can make it dad. Uh, in the book, he, there's a dad joke. There is, there is. Um, a I, very I, good dad joke. It's a very good. Well, he's a very good dad. I'm not sure the jokes are good. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and so on social media, I mean, or all, you know, with the with this massive computer I carry in my pocket, uh -huh. I can pull up a song that I remember that is apropos for the moment in yes. the moment. Yes, yes. And that's really fun. Yeah. I mean, it is really fun. And yeah. you know, my kids hate me for it, but I think it's really fun. <laughs> but but the other thing about it is. That friends, people I like, I'm not in the same room with them, and they're putting things on social media that makes me not like them as much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it affects relationships yeah. in ways that I don't know that I understood for the longest time. So mm -hmm. it's almost like, for me, it's safer not to have mm -hmm. access to what my well, friends are putting well. on social media because it affects the way I can, I could view them. Is that, um, mm, mm. Is, I don't remember you guys talking about that too much, but that's what's on my heart today. Well, <laughs> no, totally, totally. Uh, you know, I think there's three layers that each of which deserves kind of interrogation, you could say, or, or resistance in some way. And the one you just mentioned is true of actually, I think of all media to some extent, even this medium that we're using now, we're recording this on video and audio, we're not together in person. Um, so we're having a mediated conversation that always involves shrinking the band. Uh, the it, it, Basically what it involves is shrinking information. So if we were together in person, we would be absorbing so much that we don't even realize we're communicating um, about one another, wh what one another is feeling, thinking. Um, we shrink that down to these tiny little windows that we're seeing one another in here and through the audio channel. And I think that always distorts what we communicate. And it often, um, it often actually uh, encourages, you could say, us to, uh, if we're not very careful, um, we, we, almost, we can almost literally uh, shout to be heard through these mm -hmm. narrow little channels. Yeah. And I think that's part of why people put things on social media that is more outrageous than they would say in person, less kind than they would say in person, uh, less thoughtful than they would be if we had the buffer of personal presence. Um, so that's 
actually a, a challenge with all forms of mediation. It's why it's not very smart to argue by text message. <laughs> it's not actually great even to argue by phone. You really need yeah. to be there. Yeah. When you have conflict, you need to be there. Yeah. When you want to be really creative, you need to be there. So media is only useful for certain forms of human collaboration and cooperation. Mm -hmm. the, the other two things I'll mention just briefly are more specific to social media. And, and you mentioned uh, one, and then Amy has some really interesting thoughts on the other. Um, there's also this in, this issue of feedback, of this instant, um, yeah. very coarse feedback that we call likes or emojis or whatever, which is, again, far less informative than I would get if I share something with you. Even as we're talking now, because I can see, see you on video, I can get some sense, a nuanced sense of how you're responding to what I might say or not say. But when that's all filtered into a single metric of likes, that becomes very, very distorting for us. And it becomes this kind of slot machine of what, what gets the most likes. Um, and then the third thing, uh, Amy, you said something really interesting about this recently in a conversation we had is most social media are algorithm driven, which is to say that they don't even present to us just a real time feed of what our friends yeah. in distant places are thinking about and posting. They select, inevitably, they select usually through algorithms designed to maximize certain kinds of, you know, what they call user engagement, um, a subset of what could come to us. And that that subset is never uh, in the long run what's best for us. Yeah. It's what's best for our attention. It's what's best for the ads that are placed alongside it or between those Instagram posts or whatever. And the algorithm is as dangerous as the feedback of likes and the medium itself. At least that's mm -hmm. how I've come to see it. Which is why, by the way, I, I only use social media where I can cut out the algorithm. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm on the social platform Twitter uh, and I have, I've, a ridiculous number of people who follow me on Twitter. I don't know what they do with me, but what I do with them is I put just a handful of people into lists where I see everything they post. It's Twitter's not filtering it for me. Twitter's not arranging it for me. It's people I know I can trust to uh, offer things of, that over time have proved to be of value to me. Um, and I really limit how much time I spend on it because those algorithms are so, mm -hmm. so enticing and um, they're, they're addicting in their own right. Yeah. And one thing that I would I would add to that discussion of algorithms is uh, the what the algorithm appeals to is is your instinct. And in particular, mm. the way especially when I, I think of TikTok, which has kind of built mm. its the fame on its algorithm, algorithm. Yep. Um, what is uh, that algorithm, you know, we sometimes speak about the algorithm as it's outside of us, but of course, what it really does is it simply huh. tracks what you pay attention to, right? <laughs> it, it tracks um, which videos you spend just a millisecond more time on, which uh, which videos you interact with more, um, and so it is ultimately presenting to you, in some sense, <laughs> your choices. And I'm putting choices in scare quotes. But the problem is those choices are not the result of our reasoning mind. They're yeah. the result of our sort of instinctive reaction of, yeah. oh, this shocks me, this alarms me, this makes me angry, this, you know, this attracts me. And mm -hmm. it does not take into account our actual, you know, reasoning desire of what, what we actually want to spend our time consuming. And mm -hmm. so, in some sense, the algorithm is a reflection of ourself, but it's a reflection of the self that we don't want to be. And <laughs> it's a reflection of the self that we try to direct when, when we reason and when we discern. Yeah. And wow. so part, I think a very great part of the issue with algorithm based platforms is, is just that we, should not be consuming only what um, shocks us or intrigues us at the very gut level of attention. Um, we should be practicing discernment and choosing um, what it is that will genuinely enrich us and edify us. My wife and I, one night last winter, um, nobody else was in the house and, and we, uh, we watched The Social Dilemma Oh, have mm -hmm. you seen have you seen that <laughs> yes with with the little guys in your brain you know oh i really like that one give me more of those it's very colorful. <laughs> <laughs> and so we both we both have uh disengaged from social media uh yeah. for that reason now i have yeah. a friend a pretty good friend who who knows um i mean he calls he calls mark zuckerberg zuck 
I mean, he, he knows him, <laughs> yeah. you know? Okay, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, and he was one of the early uh, employees when mm-hmm. Facebook was first getting started. And he will t- he tells me, I mean, he says, look, they really are not about all that bad stuff. They really mm-hmm. are about connecting people. That's mm-hmm. what they're really about. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I, you know, I don't know. It, 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 mm-hmm. uh, my, from my from my perspective, um, even this, you know, let's let's be honest. What we're doing here, right? This is only possible. And you talk about mediating. So we have this mediating thing where you're in Pennsylvania, yeah. you're in New York, yeah. and I'm in Virginia, and we're having this conversation. And it's a, I mean, podcasts are kind of more real than you know, talking head shouting shows on TV, um, <laughs> and, you know, but. Um, we're going to edit this and, <laughs> yes, of course, and then of course. we're going to package it. Yeah. And then we're going to post it on Instagram <laughs> and Facebook <laughs> and, and send it out to people on emails and hope that they have a device <laughs> and that they'll listen to it. Uh, you know, so to, 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 yeah, you know, I mean, I'm doing it because, you know, my, my, uh, our, our audience of parents who homeschool their children. This is very, in, you know, this is a really uh, important topic for them, and we hope that yeah. it will bless them. But well, we're doing all of the things that you talk about here. <laughs> I, I agree, and I get it, and and I think that... Um, so quit listening, everybody. Yeah, yeah, stop. Turn it off. Quick. That's right. No, I mean, here, I think technology is, among many things, it's truly good for. Um, I would think I would say just uh, by way of kind of categories, the thing that technology is best at is is certain kinds of safety. When I'm in the hospital and I need an IV drip at a certain rate of medication, I'm so grateful there are de- devices that do that more reliably than any human, even the best intentioned, but high, most highly skilled human could do. So technology really has added to certain kinds of safety. The other thing it's really good at is the dissemination or distribution or amplification of human activity in the world. And to the extent that human beings make good things in the world, technology helps us to send them farther, send them wider uh, scale in certain ways that can be very good. And that's, that's really what we hope we'll use media for, for this conversation. I would point out (laughs) that the one thing it is not good for is forming us into the kind of people who can make something worth publishing something worth scaling. So the fact that we can have this conversation over over technology and that other people can access it, to the extent it's a worthwhile conversation, it's because we turned off screens in our house and raised our daughter and our son in a different way. And you did too, Jim, and you've made choices. And, you, and all of us are continually making choices to be formed as persons, um, which is why I don't worry that much about technology in the workplace but I worry about it very much in the formative institutions of any society. And, and for me, I would think of those as home first, uh, church or religious community second, and school or whatever takes the place of school and education third. These are the places where we are meant to be shaped as human beings. And in those places, I, don't, I definitely don't want an algorithm. I definitely don't want easy because easy doesn't form us. Um, I don't want these shortcuts. And if we had not had those formative experiences in non-technological environments, we we would come in here and do our best, but we'd have, frankly, a very shallow conversation. And that's exactly what you see kind of playing out in our world right now, is people who were not formed. Um, so I really don't object to using it. Uh, you know, I publish books. We kill a lot of trees <laughs> through industrial processes and put them on Kindle and screens and all that. Um, but I can only write the books because I turn it all off <laughs> and because I've done so at, at uh, intervals in my, in my life, by, by the grace of God, I'd say. Yeah. And what I would add to that, too, is that um, what we're trying to avoid is for screens to form us themselves because yes, exactly. we exactly. I, I, you know, I am who I am because of the the graciousness and the wisdom of my parents, and I am formed by them. But I, I, screens could have formed me, right? It's Mm. not that they're, you know, often people say, oh, well, technology is neutral. And I, I understand where they're coming from, but I I think that it, it ignores the way that every device we use has a set of expectations for who the user is and how the user can, well, to put it a little 
coarsely how how the user can make money for the company who who sells the device. Um, mm. And so our devices can shape us, inform us just as much as the institutions we're in, as our families and our friends, our communities. Yeah. And yeah. it is exactly that kind of formation which we want to avoid. And I think that mm. all of our kind of tech wise stuff that Dad and I talk about is exactly about that issue of formation of screens, screens are, are well and good and can be used in excellent ways. But if they start forming us into the person who Apple wants me to be, instead of the person who my mom and my dad want me to be, that is where it becomes really dangerous. And what I hope is that disseminating this particular conversation on all of these platforms, um, that when people hear it, they will not be being formed into the person that mm -hmm. Facebook wants them to be, or to be the, the, the pair of eyeballs that TikTok wants them to be. And I, I really hope and believe that by setting aside screens for, and, and using them in ways that are appropriate and fruitful, we will be formed in a way that is much better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's kind of what this life is meant to be, right? Uh, character mm. formation for the purpose yeah. that we've been made and not not to be made over in the image of this world. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Or the image of ourselves. Or, <laughs> well, yeah. Our, or, the, or, or of make our worst, our, yeah. most instinctive selves. Yeah. Uh, how, how, how amazing. You mentioned three things that, you know, this pandemic has really mm. brought to the fore. Yeah. Um, people separated mm. from each other, isolated. Um, people doing Facebook church or Zoom church um, and children yeah. learning through screens and each. So this has really been, I think your book was probably written before the pandemic. It looks like it came, it came out during the pandemic year, but you probably wrote a lot of it before that. Um, what are your, you, you mentioned it. So yeah. this, this uh, do you think people have learned because of the disruptions of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, for me, the first day back to live church was just uh, awesome, yeah. right? I uh, mean, it, I mean, uh, awesome in the uh, uh, in the original meaning of the word, sense. awe inspiring, yeah. you know? It's yeah. like, oh, how did we miss this for so long? Or, um, mm. you know, uh, I, I we homeschooled and our children are all adults now, but here professionally, you know, we hear a lot yeah. about how people, um, saw through the zoom window what was going on in the public school so there was there were two things happening there the zoom window was not good for kids just generally i mean it's obviously not a good thing but then it was also a window into what was you know the content and the the, the quality yes yes so that's right have you exactly. have you guys thought about that since you've written your books how the pandemic has changed things yeah, I'll offer a couple of thoughts, and then Amy probably has even better thoughts. Uh, you know, all, with you, uh, so I also, I'm a, a Christian, and uh, I remember the first time, I think after about a year, that I was in a room with other fellow Christians saying the Lord's Prayer aloud together. I actually, mm -hmm. I work for a Christian nonprofit, and we actually say it together on Zoom. We have prayer times on Zoom, or have done during the mm -hmm. pandemic. Um, but we we mute our microphones because you can't actually do things in unison on Zoom. Right. It doesn't work. Right. Um, and the the first time I experienced hearing those voices in concert, um, saying this prayer that every Christian learns, it was just really stunning. Like, oh my goodness, I didn't even, I had almost forgotten how much I need this and how much I miss this. I do think that um, the pandemic has had that effect. Unfortunately, I th and uh, well, uh, just to say on the since the positive side of the ledger, I do think it's also exposed. Uh, I think before 2020, uh, a lot of people thought, oh, you know, there must be a way to do online school that's effective. And I actually think for adult learners on certain technical topics, there's lots of ways to learn uh, yeah. through technology. But the younger the learner, the more immersive and formative and really character oriented the learning, which is so much of primary and secondary education, the worse it is. And I don't think anyone can come out of this pandemic and say with a straight face that primarily online school, the way it was delivered during the pandemic is, is viable, especially for small children. Um, and that's not to say there's not a place for, especially in high school, for online classes and that kind of thing. But 
but as a primary mode of education, yeah. we just learned this does not work. I will say I'm I'm actually quite concerned because mm-hmm. I, I ultimately, and this is perhaps partly my own religious point of view, but I, I do think human beings <laughs> uh, were bent in certain ways. And one of the things we're bent towards is uh, the easy and the effortless. We, it, when given a choice uh, between something that's hard, but will be good in the long run, and something that's not so great, but is easy in the short run. Mm-hmm. I just, I know my own life, I choose the easy. And these virtual ways of being in the world are a lot less risky, a lot less fraught with uh, the unexpected and the uncontrollable. Mm-hmm. Um, Sherry Turkle, who's a very interesting psychologist at MIT, asked ask college students, why do you like to text your friends? And their answer is because I can control mm-hmm. how I present myself yeah. through text. Yeah. And when I'm with them in conversation, I, I feel uncomfortable. I don't know what they're thinking of me, but I can reread that text 20 times until it's right. Mm-hmm. And when given the option of being feeling easy and in control, I think actually a lot of us have decided, you know, I'm not sure I'm ready to go back out into that world where things are harder and I don't feel as in control. And I fear we're going to be seeing that for a mm-hmm. long time, actually the resistance to re-engaging. As much as we'll know at some level that it's good out there, I think people, you know, a surprising number of people are going to say, you know, I think I'm good in here. Um, I'm afraid that's going to be true. Um, mm-hmm. But I don't know, Amy, you may have, have more hopeful thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> I think I do, in some sense, have a little more hope, especially when I think about my peers as as college oh. students. I yeah. there certainly is there. There's a small subset of college students um, who would say, "Oh, I I missed Zoom classes and I missed how I didn't have to walk to class and how I could take my I could get onto class while lying in my bed and maybe fall asleep in the middle." Um, and so I do see some kind of lack of interest in reengaging. But it has really struck me how so many of of my peers as college students just longed to return to in-person classes Mm. in a way that like I never, if you had told me three years ago that today my my peers would be yearning to go to an 8 (laughs) a.m. in Bard Hall, you know, um, (laughs) I would have been really surprised. And what I have seen that gives me hope is that I think that for a lot of people, this the pandemic has exposed what technology can do and what it can't do. Um, one of the things that we have kind of talked about in our family is that the word apocalypse um, <laughs> really means uh, an unveiling, a revelation, yeah. um, an uncovering of what we what we didn't know before. And I think yeah. we really that has so happened with this little apocalypse of the pandemic that. Yeah everything that things have been revealed. And I think that one of the many sort of revelations is the ways that screens really cannot substitute for all of the things that that we love about our in-person activities. And in particular, when I think of just the passion and joy of my fellow students, when when we got back to in-person classes, the excitement about like returning to, I, I'm a singer, to singing in person as a choir with, with my, my chorus group, um, I see such a deep hunger for embodied um, presence together. And I don't think that cancels out all of the very real sort of fear, a uh, combination of, 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 of fear and a desire for ease that we do see in people seeking to keep on um, the, these online modes of being. But I do think that when I look at my peers, uh, we know that there is something so much better and we really want it. So the last chapter of your book is we can live in hope. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be a good place to end. Why do you think that we can live in hope? I mean, (laughs) I don't, I'm, I don't think I buy it. What, what's up? Um, It is an audacious (laughs) claim. (laughs) Dad, would you like to start a today? No, 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 you should go. This is your your chapter. Well, (laughs) I, I would, I would say two things. Um, It is important that I, I do see all of this through the lens of my religious belief and my faith as as a Christian personally, but I would hope that people from all different kinds of backgrounds can see these two things as a sign of of hope. 
Um, the first is the power of habit. And in some ways, the power of habit is actually what got us into this mess, right? The, <laughs> the incredible hold that our devices have over us is so much because of habit and because we so easily fall into habits of um, kind of spirals of distraction, of envy, of discontent. But I actually believe that just as, just as easily as a habit forms with our devices, so we can also create habits that work against um, the kind of tyranny of technology in our lives and help establish a tech-wise life. Earlier, I mentioned leaving uh, phones out of, out of your, your room where you sleep. Um, I also believe that the simple, simple steps like sharing meals with no screens mm. with other people, um, structuring your, your work such that technological distractions, not necessarily the technological tools you use, but the distractions of you know, social media, of entertainment are away from you. Um, and of regular, regular times of simply screen-free, just you being, um, those, kinds of those kinds of habits have the power to genuinely shape us and transform our lives no matter how small they would seem. So that's the first one. And then I think the second one is that we don't have to be alone. So often, you know, our devices say that they connect us. You're so right. Facebook thinks that it is connecting us. <laughs> and it's not that that isn't true, but so often our use of uh, devices actually draws us further into ourselves, into isolation. But that is not, thank goodness, that is not who we are. We are people within communities of, of love, of brokenness, but also of love. And I really believe that if we um, speak to the people around us and just say, just honestly bring up this question of how we use technology wisely, I think that as a community, we are always going to be better suited, be better equipped really, um, to face the struggles of technology than if we were alone. And I think that if we take action together, whether that's in the family context, as my mom and my dad and my brother and I do, um, or in our communities of friendships or our institutions, our schools and churches, I really believe that in community, there is a way to find a tech wise life. Hmm. Andy, any final thoughts? <laughs> You've been ger generous with your time and- I'm so, I'm I'm just uh, feeling too proud of my daughter to uh, okay. have anything further to say. <laughs> well, I I I will have a final thought then on that point. The book is My Techwise Life. It's uh, written by Amy Crouch with these wonderful um, responsive letters of a loving father to his daughter. Um, worth the price of admission just for that. <laughs> um, I, I, it really, it really touched me, well, and I think it will well. others as well. Not to mention that there is an awful lot of wisdom and uh, good advice um, and and things to think about in the book. So uh, thanks again, Andy. Well, Andy, I did want to ask you one question. Amy mm. mentioned that apocalypse has a meaning, a real <laughs> meaning that's somewhat different than what we think. Yes. yes. What in the world is a praxis? <laughs> <laughs> You, you work at Praxis, but what is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, what a great question. It is another Greek word like apocalypse is originally, and it's, it means action. It, and, um, and actually specifically in the world of Greek thought, there was the idea of theoria from which we get the word theory and then praxis, which meant we get the word practical from it. So theory and praxis in in a healthy life, go together. That is, you think about the world, but then you actually put it into action. And at Praxis, we work with entrepreneurs who are putting, in this case, uh, we're, we're a Christian organization. We work with people who are putting their Christian faith into action in the ventures they build for profit and nonprofit. And we are the action side of belief. If you believe certain things are true, what would you build in the world? That's Praxis. Mm -hmm. Well, very good. I, I'm so pleased you could join us today. Again, the book is My Tech Wise Life. And um, contrary to everything we've said, I'm going to ask you to 
like and follow us on <laughs> Facebook and uh, Instagram and visit our website and learn more about us. We're Homeschool Legal Defense Association. And there's a lot of good stuff there, but do it wisely. Do it Train wisely. the algorithm. Train the algorithm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm such a hypocrite. I feel terrible now, but... but <laughs> anyway, uh, thanks again, and uh, thank you for listening to our podcast. And really, do we do have a lot of good information on our website. Um, Amy, what are you planning to do once you finish your linguistics studies? Oh, I am still figuring that out. Stay tuned. <laughs> okay, very good. Well, thanks again. And uh, for Homeschool Talks, I'm Jim Mason. Today's episode is made possible by HSLDA's Compassion Grants Program. Whether it's a low-income family trying to make ends meet or a family suffering after a natural disaster, some families simply wouldn't have the resources to homeschool without the help of fellow homeschoolers like you. Our Compassion Grants exist to make this support possible. To learn more about how you can help make homeschooling possible for struggling families or to request assistance if you are homeschooling through hard times, visit hslda.org compassion. That's hslda.org compassion. Thanks for listening to this episode of Homeschool Talks. If you enjoyed this conversation, leave a review to let us know what you think. To hear more conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to this podcast or head on over to hslda.org slash podcast for more inspiring stories and awesome ideas about homeschooling. That's all for today. We hope you enjoyed the program and we'll see you next time.